Welcome to Intangibles, a podcast about traits, behaviors, and qualities that entrepreneurs can cultivate to help be successful. I'm your host, Steve Berg. I'm a partner at a New York City-based venture capital fund called Lytical Ventures. Lytical Ventures focuses on early stage investments of companies that drive corporate intelligence. Corporate intelligence includes, for example, cybersecurity, data and analytics, and artificial intelligence. You can find us at www.liticalventures.com. Lytical is spelled L-Y-T-I-C-A-L. Ventures, all one word, dot com. This season is brought to you by Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice from Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. We have a new production partner this season, VC Careers. If you're looking for a job in venture capital, join over 8,000 VCs and VC job hunters on John Gannon's VC Jobs email list. Visit johngannonblog.com slash intangibles to learn more and to subscribe. Also, please find Intangibles on its new home on the web, www.intangiblespodcast, all one word, dot com. Today's podcast topic is creativity. We covered creativity once before, but not in the way we're going to look at it today. My guest today is Dr. Elkonen Goldberg. He's a clinical professor of neurology at New York University School of Medicine and director of Luria Neuroscience Institute. Dr. Goldberg divides his time between research in cognitive neuroscience, clinical practice in neuropsychology, and teaching. In other words, we have a guest today that knows a thing or two about how the brain works when it comes to creativity and innovation. And also, I'm in way over my head. I thought it would make sense to examine what is going on in our brains as we work through the creative process and also find out what we can do, if anything, to foster creativity. Dr. Goldberg, welcome. I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you today and thank you. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and experiences. My pleasure. Delighted to be here. Let's further establish your bona fides. Explain what you do for a living and also tell us a little bit about the types of things you've studied. Well, um, I live a pretty eclectic life. I have a practice in clinical neuropsychology with an office literally two blocks away from the studio where I see patients that, uh, that with various forms of brain damage. My work is strictly diagnostic. I don't do therapy. But these are people with traumatic brain injury, with dementia, with stroke, with learning disabilities, a whole gamut of conditions affecting the brain where fine-tuned diagnosis is required, and I help with that. But this is one uh, the, of the several bolts that I try to keep in there. Uh, I uh, am still an act, a, real, a relatively active researcher, not as active as I used to be a few decades ago, but still relatively active. Uh, the conduct research in cognitive neuroscience, and they teach. I do a fair amount of postgraduate teaching. They're teaching people with already advanced degrees in psychology uh, about neuropsychology. And I've written a number of books, so that is also a time-consuming activity. And people invite me all over the world to lecture. I just came back from Japan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just a couple of things to keep yourself busy. Correct. Um, you, one of the ways that we connected was your book on creativity. Um, maybe just a little info for us on that and what it's all about, almost as a way to set the table for what we're going to discuss. Well, it's a, a book which was published a few months ago, literally. It's titled Creativity, the Human Brain in the Age of Innovation. It's, you see, I became interested in creativity relatively recently, uh, uh, the, how the brain deals with cognitive novelty has been one of the lifelong themes of my research, okay? And uh, as I was thinking about it, in fact, I, my initial plan was to write a book about how the brain deals with novelty. But the more I was thinking about it, the more it was kind of a, a turning toward creativity, but it was basically a, a fascination with novelty and the attraction to novelty is one of the kind of prerequisite of creativity. Perhaps not the only one, but... 
uh, one of the main ones. So that's how the book evolved. And uh, in terms of my own background, I have always been interested in the humanities and also in uh, in biology. In, so, uh, and as I was uh, uh, familiarizing myself with uh, research in, on creativity, and you know, a few years ago, it it was a marginal topic, kind of a new age topic. But to the, over the last few years, maybe a decade, decade and a half, creativity has been embraced by mainstream neuroscience as a as a legitimate and more than legitimate as a central topic of research. So there is a huge body of literature. And what struck me is that uh, uh, there is some work on creativity which is strictly cultural. And then there is work on creativity which is strictly biological. Well, people use various uh, genetic and neuroimaging techniques and so on and so forth. But on the, kind of a, to put it in a broader perspective, any complex manifestation of human cognition is some is a product of interaction between biology and culture. Okay, there is some kind of a synergy between the two. How it works, we don't understand really. Okay, but I felt that in order to really uh, understand or begin to understand how a complex uh, set of processes leading to human underlying human creativity operate, you need to somehow integrate these two narratives. And so that became basically the goal, objective behind the book, to somehow integrate these two narratives, the biological and the cultural narrative about the prerequisites of creativity. And the truth of the matter is, there's probably very few people out there yeah. whose um, areas of study kind of create that bridge. And and you are actually one of the few, be, being not only a, uh, a professor, but also a, a, a still in clinical study. So I, uh, that's actually what drew me to it. Um, with, with regarding to your comments to novelty, for sure we'll get to that. I want to I want to kind of start out a little bit with uh, a baseline. And the, you know, you always go to the dictionary when you're looking for a baseline. And the dictionary defines creativity as the ability to transcend traditional ideas, rules, patterns, relationships, and to create meaningful new ideas, forms, methods, or interpretations. Creativity is originality, progressiveness, and imagination. Do you think that definition is right? Not enough. Not and, enough. And salience and relevance. Uh, because, you know, uh, one can uh, put all one's creative juices into designing something which is of totally inconsequential for humanity, and it will be ignored. So, yes, it's all of the above, plus something that resonates with society as important. As relevant. So what you're saying is you can be potentially too early on an idea, uh, and and in which case society will not be able to take in that new idea and process it in a way that they can drive value out of it. Correct. And in fact, I find this whole this thought has basically occupied preoccupied me for many years. And uh, the, I, I wrote, a, basically expanded on this idea in my other books. And the creativity book, is fact, is, in fact, is dedicated to the anonymous individuals who were so far ahead of their time that nobody noticed, okay? So I did it, since we don't know who they are, I could not name them, but I'm sure that those are. And that basically kind of a trigger is a very almost a nihilistic thought, well, in some sense, that people who will regard the formal geniuses may in fact have been second growth. You see what I'm saying? That there may have been somebody who was even, who were even more, further ahead of their time, and those were, the, and the genius of those people was not recognized. It was flatly ignored, right? Yeah, because yeah, the society yeah. just wasn't capable. Yeah. Um, I want to walk through uh, the following statement. Um related to what we just talked about, right? And and that statement is that within the creative brain, there's no exclusive seat. Um, the reason is the more multi uh, componential a mental process is, the more moving parts collaborate within the brain supporting it. So the less feasible is the idea of locating a thing, in this case, creativity, to a particular part of the brain. Correct. That's correct. Correct. All right. Um, let's review some of the moving parts as, as you've defined them. Um, salience, 
was the first one, right? That's, <clears throat> is that salience, is that timeliness or is that the ability to pose um, central problems and ask important questions to for the time? And pose central problems and ask important questions. Yes. Whether it's first or second or third, I don't know. I don't know how to rank these various prerequisites, but it's one of the important ones. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the, suppose Albert Einstein had spent his time designing beautiful gardens. Uh, you know, he would have been recognized as a design, very talented designer of beautiful gardens, but probably would not have been recognized as one of the foremost contributors to human civilization kind of culture. Yeah. Right. Um, the thing that strikes me about salience is that is intrinsically subjective. It is subjective in the population sense. The, the, yeah, the, the subjudication of what is salient and what is not, of course, is rendered by each of us individually, but ultimately the verdict is rendered by society. That's that correct. Was, if I think that something is important, but the society doesn't agree with me, then uh, my my uh, you know uh, uh, my contribution will be ignored. It's a bad in in my parlance. It's a bad product market fit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> broadly speaking, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, because I have a neuroscientist uh, neuroscientist in front of me, I want to ask about. The what's going on in the brain around salience, and I, I understand it has to do with dopamine modulation, and and I'm already out of my depth, so so help help us, and also yeah. keep in mind that you know pretty smart folks paying attention, but probably not neuroscientists. Well, uh, the, it probably involves a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex which in itself is a complex construct. It consists of several moving parts in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, the phantom polar, the anterior single. Um, so in concert, these structures, which together we refer to the prefrontal cortex, probably play a particularly important role in deciding what's important and what's not. Right. Okay. And this has been another focus of my lifelong interest. In fact, I wrote uh, two books. One is titled Frontal Lobes, uh, the, uh, the Executive Brain, Frontal Lobes, uh, the, uh, the Civilized Mind. The other one was titled The New Executive Brain, Frontal Lobes in the Complex World. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, so uh, the, I sneaked in this topic into my new creativity book as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Is salience from the construction of our mind, is that an iterative process or is it a process whereby we're seeking maximum arousal via the dopamine? Um, I just, I, I, again, I, don't, I, I know it's not highly impactful when we think about the creative process in terms of what it is, but I'm fascinated by the pieces behind it that are happening within my head. Right. It's... Uh, it may take many forms. I'm not being evasive, but it, uh, it probably may take, almost certainly may take many forms. I think that any kind of a consequential discovery and process is not likely to result as a single aha moment, okay? It may culminate in a single aha moment, but it will be a culmination of a very long iterative process. Okay. And uh, the, the dopamine modulation does play a role in it, but there are other mechanisms at play. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think a, a technical enough for me at the moment. I'm going to move on. So you mentioned novelty. That is, in fact, a moving part. And I, it's I, a very important moving I part. feel that that is the propulsive part of the creative process. I, I feel agree. that's almost like the driver that moves, the seeking of novelty. Um, as a society, we're con you know, I'm constantly talking to my colleagues and they're like, oh, that's very interesting. And I think what they mean is, oh, that's very novel. I'm coming across a new idea or a new, uh, something put forward that I haven't seen before. And I think that that is what, you know, that, that excitement or interest in something that's interesting is really just kind of a shorthand way of saying, I haven't seen that before. It's novel. I agree. I agree. Um, I think that it is the, uh, if one were to rank various processes that drive creativity, I would put that one uh, uh, at the top, or near um, the top. So, in is it fair to say that creativity can't exist without 
novelty seeking? I think it's a fair to, uh, fair to say uh, this. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. Other other than through sheer highly improbable stroke of luck, right? Um, can novelty be operationalized in some form or manner? Well, novelty is something which does not had, had not existed before. I think that actually novelty can be operationalized in a much more straightforward way than creativity, because what's creative and what's not is somewhat in the eye of the beholder. What's novel and what's not can be operationalized much more readily empirically. Yeah, I think I okay. I understand that. Um, so you know, I ask about salience, and you told me about the prefrontal cortex. If I ask about novelty, I think you're going to tell me about the right hemisphere and the prefrontal cortex and the prefrontal <laughs> cortex. Um, can you just oh? Um, well, one, can you ex just explain a little bit about what might be going on? And then two, I think there's actually a transition. If I recall from the book, there's a transition at the beginning, it's all right hemisphere, but then all of a sudden at some point it becomes left hemisphere. Well, uh, yeah, the, it's never all one or the other. You, you know, any complex, even modestly complex process has some elements of novelty, some elements of, of old knowledge. Uh, the, uh, the, so uh, the, in reality, at any given time, it's all of the above, but in different admixtures. So, yes, the, 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 the frontal lobes and the right hemisphere are particularly important at, uh, the, at early stages of, of exploration of anything. And that is the, the link of the frontal lobes to novelty and to salience is pretty, uh, at this point, uncontroversial notion. Most of my colleagues would agree with that, yeah? yeah. This link of the right hemisphere to novelty uh, is less universally accepted. And this has been sort of my kind of a hobby horse for many years. Uh, the, you see, the, tra uh, the, the tell me if I'm kind of digressing too much. Uh, the, the conventional narrative about the two hemispheres is that one is uh, the, in charge of language, the other one is in charge of nonverbal processes. Uh, the left hemisphere, language hemisphere, the right hemisphere, non Well, this notion is, I never thought that this notion was incorrect but I have always thought that it was incomplete. The simple reason being that it precludes any evolutionary consideration because these dichotomy, because verbal and nonverbal processes are devoid of any meaning outside of our species. So I was looking for something which would be equally applicable in an evolutionary context. And the, the, kind of a prompted by some clinical observations, which we don't have the time to explain, um, the, uh, the I came upon this notion linking one hemisphere to novelty and the other one to cognitive routines. And that, uh, in fact, in this creativity book, I devote a fair amount of time explaining and kind of a, uh, defending this notion. And, and, and yes, I think that there is this privileged relationship between novelty seeking and the right hemisphere. So, so there is that relationship, but it's more clear, at least I thought I understood, that when something becomes rote that's when it moves over to the right hemisphere. When, when something becomes familiarized and kind of reduced to, to yeah, well, I wrote in a broad sense, reduced to some well-rehearsed cognitive routines and strategies and representations in that broad sense. Right. So, so it, let's take, for example, of, uh, I'm learning a new piece on the piano. Yeah. And I just begin to practice it. There's a good chance a good portion of my left hemisphere is going to do it. And then I get to the point where, yes, I can play that. I can look at you. I can be doing other things at the same time, and I can still play that. It is now moved over to the right hemisphere of in my brain for the most. In some sense, yes. Okay. Yes. And in fact, there are some data uh, uh, demonstrating that processing music occurs in musical labor, which most people are, with predominant reliance on the right hemisphere, but in trained musicians with predominant reliance on the left hemisphere. Oh, and I yeah. just confused the heck out of me. Yeah. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm still, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move on from novelty. Um, one of the things that seems obvious, but only once you've said it out loud, is that creativity is essentially the ability to take old knowledge and either interject something new or relate that old knowledge to a new problem. 
Yeah, yes, in the broad sense. I have a friend at the, in Australia, neuroscientist, actually he's an American transplant, Alan Snyder, who likes to say that everything that's completely new has got to be wrong. Right. Okay? Uh, uh, so, There's no such thing as something new, essentially. Uh, uh, well, in some sense. Basically, we construct new constructs, create new constructs by somehow reconfiguring elements of other older constructs I see. Uh, 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 to a very large extent. So its ability to, uh, the, the, this kind of a generativity which allows you to manipulate and uh, dismember and recombine and reconfigure some elements of prior knowledge. That's how new knowledge is, is, is arrived at. So that is, so I think, that, I think it's really important to kind of put quotes around that. You're talking about the ability to generate kind of multiple or diverse approaches to a problem kind of vis-a-vis -vis mental flexibility. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Good. Um, so let's talk about this notion of not necessarily giving up on your creative process, right? Because creativity, let's face it, it's, it's hard. Right, and, and and it's not, and you're, there's not a whole bunch of aha moments out there. Well, maybe there are, but it's only after a long, sustained effort, right? right? A lot of rumination, a lot of kind of mental process going on in the back, a lot of you know, kind of deep cognitive work, heavy lifting. Correct. Um, let's talk about the ability to deploy a sustained effort. What does that, what does that, what does that for our brains, what does that mean? What is that in terms of time? What is that in terms of effort? What's going on? Well, uh, f in, in terms of the brain, again, it means the prefrontal cortex in an active state. Okay. And also, uh, uh, certain the structures of the brainstem, which are in charge of general arousal and activation. Mm -hmm. They have to, the, the, their contribution is necessary to maintain these active states. Uh, there, so this interaction between the cortex, particularly the prefrontal cortex, and the brainstem is very important. I see. Yeah. Um, the next one, I know we're kind of clicking through them at a, at a fairly rapid pace, but I think... So you see what we're doing? We are basically beginning to enlist more and more structures into this process. That's exactly and right. All, and they all play different roles. So it's not the same as to say that the brain is some kind of an equipotential, the homogeneous, the, you know, substance. It's not. It's highly uh, articulated and heterogeneous. But there are many moving parts. They all contribute different things, but there are a lot of them. But what you, I mean, what, I don't know if people are picking up on it yet, but what we're sneakily doing here yeah. is we're explaining the process, right? Yeah. The first is the salience, then yeah. the novelty, then applying old knowledge to yeah. new problems, yeah. then mental flexibility, right. Right. then pursuit. Like, <clears throat> that is how if you broke down creativity, that's how the steps happen, right? Um, the next one is really hard for me because I'm a process-driven individual. Um, it's something that you call mental wandering. Correct. Um, first of all, just to ex describe that for folks and then why it's such a key part of, of the creative process. Right. Well, mental wandering is not my notion. I mean, this notion has been around before me, Okay. Uh, but I think that it's a very important notion. It is the ability of the mind, and also that means of the brain, to sh to shed some constraints inherent in our preconceptions, and to allow itself to explore freely. And that to paradoxically maintain entail the suspension of frontal lobe control. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I don't have that. My frontal lobe is like, nope, I got this. Don't, <laughs> don't worry. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure that you have your moments. Yeah. Um, but then the next part is, is mental focus. And that's actually where I, I, I'm stronger. So, so while I'm giving up on the mental wandering, the mental focus um, is something that I can help. But that's, part of, but that's kind of bringing back, things back into focus, there's right? There's an interplay between the that's two. That's it, right. Yeah. That's the really interesting thing. You kind of like go on walkabout, yep, you discover yep, some new yep, things, yep. then you bring it all back and go. Yep. In other words, 
what has to be extraordinary, extraordinarily lucky to just come upon something really novel and useful and creative through just mental wandering alone. Mental wandering works when it operates in juxtaposition with mental focus. So there is this kind of a back and forth, back and forth between these states. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if, we can't, if I can't do the mental wandering, then the mental focus isn't all that valuable. Um, well, one of the things that um, you can't really grab on to the process unless you have is dissatisfaction with the way things currently are. It's old, it's antiquated, it's not efficient enough, it's not clever enough. Um, you've got to be almost kind of disgruntled, right? Yeah. So complacency is not good for creativity. That's a, a different way of saying it. You're yeah. absolutely right. In one of my earlier books, there is a book that I wrote many years ago, which I The Wisdom Paradox. The, uh, Do I know this book? Yeah. Yes, I know of this book. Uh -huh. I have not read it. So I have a chapter there titled Magellan on Prozac, where I talk <laughs> about precisely that, that had Magellan and Columbus and all these great mariners, discoverers, had Prozac available to them, maybe this America would still not remain undiscovered. Okay? Yeah, they'd have been like, oh, it's cool, man. Because I'll it's stay cool here. To, to stay in Seville or wherever they were and uh, just popping their Prozac. So are you uh, basically saying that you, in praise of the HD, ADHD community out there, that they're, they're possibly, um, that that is not a shortcoming, that is in fact potentially a strength? No, I'm not saying that. Oh, I'm okay. Saying that. No, I was, I might uh, bridge too far. Bridge too far. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I, have, I have my old gripes with this whole construct of ADHD, but that's a very different conversation. Right. Yeah. Um, and then we talked about cultural re resonance, meaning that's just time. That's a timing thing. You've got to kind of match your uh, supply and demand. Um, okay. So novelty, frontal lobes, right hemisphere, uh, accumulated knowledge, left hemisphere, uh, importance and relevance, frontal lobes, dopamine signaling, uh, non-conformist. We that that's kind of this dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction right. with it. Yeah. What about that in terms of the brain? Well, there has been some very interesting work implicating uh, the anterior cingulate structure in uh, in uh, sort of keeping behavior in line with expectations. In effect, being the substrate, in, well, I shouldn't say substrate because that's like simplify, oversimplify the matter, but contributing to conformism because this urge to align one's behavior with expectations is conformism, okay? Mm -hmm. And conformism, broadly speaking, is a very good attribute for society. Without, you know, uh, we follow the laws, we uh, have certain expectations of one another's behavior and behave accordingly, and without this kind of a broad conformism, society would not would not be able to, to, to function, okay? But, uh, but uh, you know, uh, the flip side of conformism is that it leads to, it is antithetical to individual creativity. Right. So there has to be this capacity for non-conformism. And there has been some very interesting work implicating, uh, 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 the, uh, linking, for instance, uh, the anterior cingulate cortex in conformism and demonstrating that by inhibiting it, you, uh, the, uh, you enhance the opposite, the non-conformism. Uh, I am not saying that conformism or non-conformism can be localized to a particular part of the way. That is almost certainly incorrect. But but again, we are beginning to understand the neural substrate there. Right. So yeah. what I, I think your last comment was, okay, we can't understand the, what the process in the brain might be, but we can understand the different parts of the brain that govern those processes. Or at least contribute to them. Right, contribute to them. Contribute okay. to them. Um, so when I think about all of those things, what strikes me is that everyone's brain is going to kind of grow and evolve completely differently. Correct. So there's no way to actually measure creativity kind of concretely or even define a specific type of creativity within an individual. We didn't even touch on that, right? There's multiple different types of, of creativity out Correct. there. Um, there can't even be only one kind of creativity. So how, let's talk about some of the different types of creativity that actually exist, right? So if there's multiple types out there, what kind of creativity? Well, if you just look at the same kind of a... The, uh, 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 
a flippant response to your uh, question, which is a very interesting question, would be to say, well, different types of human endeavor require different types of creativity. That is probably true. But, if, it's all, but even within the same field of human endeavor, you can see different forms of creativity. In fact, I talk about it in, in, in my, my new book. Uh, look at music. Beethoven and Mozart are regarded as two foremost at the very pinnacle of the, the of, uh, musical composition. Their, uh, their working styles were very different. Their oeuvre was very different. Uh, Beethoven, who lived a longer life, had created fewer symphonies. Uh, the Mozart, who, who lived a shorter life, uh, uh, just was generating them uh, you know, ad infinitum, okay? Obviously, very different creative processes, okay? Yeah. And Beethoven used to write and rewrite and do rework his uh, the symphonies. Evidently, Mozart less so. If you look at mathematics, uh, my, my favorite example, Gauss, you know, the author of the Gaussian curve, yeah. and one of the greatest mathematicians of all times, and Galois, uh, this young French rebel who died in a duel at the age of, I think, 22 or something like that. Very different lives yes. and very different creative processes. Gauss, very orderly kind of a uh, professor, and, uh, uh, Galois, brawler, uh, and the rebel, um, the, the, and, but, but they are uh, equally uh, important mathematicians. So obviously different personalities and different underlying creative processes. So I want to dig in on that a little bit. I, um, we were talking before, and I, and I, I mentioned that I once had um, the actress Laura Linney on the podcast, and I asked her uh, the following two questions uh, about creative process and i'm really curious to compare your answers to hers the first one i asked her about um bob dylan and when bob dylan was asked how he writes songs like mr tambourine man or or maggie's farm or shelter from the storm um his response is always something akin to uh, I really, it just happens. Yeah, I don't know. Just, I don't know how. I'm just lucky to be around. Exactly. Yeah, I'm yeah. just lucky to be in the room, and it does. Yeah, so good. Yeah, I, yeah. I found a. I found a, somebody who's yeah. kind of sympathetic. Um, I mean, is that creative genius? What's going on there? Uh, okay. Conceptual creativity. With all humility, I'll say I don't believe it. Okay? You don't believe it. That may be his introspection. I'm not saying that he's making it up. That may be probably is his honest introspection. Yes. But i I would imagine that it's a culmination of very long, deliberate, effortful process that he really thought about his music and played and replayed into his head and that he had these aha moments. In the so, note, right. Yeah, so introspectively, the, the, I'm sure that I imagine that that's how he feels about it. But what he probably skips is the kind of a prelude which takes years or maybe uh, leading to, to these happy moments. Right. Yeah. Right. So you're, what you're saying is there, in your view, there's probably no such thing as creative genius in that, in that no, 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 purest... No, 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 he's a creative genius, I mean. Uh, but creative genius is a combination... In any creative genius, this aha moment is preceded by hard work. I see. I see. So and, and people like Einstein talk about it. There were several creative geniuses even before creativity became a, kind of a, the subject of formal uh, research. There were several creative geniuses of kind of a first-class creative geniuses who tried to understand through introspection their own processes. Albert Einstein wrote about it. Yeah. And he basically comments on the hard work part of it. Yeah. So the next guy was um, Leonard Cohen, yeah. right? And he wrote Hallelujah. Yeah. And it um, he wrote, I think, 85 versions over five years. So that the Mozart and Beethoven for you. Exactly. So, so, and, and all, I mean, ultimately, I mean, I think people who have heard the Jeff Buckley version, the just beautiful, gorgeous, yeah, almost yeah. Christmas Carol like yeah, version yeah. of it, um, think, oh, you know, this is perfection. This is in fact genius. Um, but I think it sounds to me you know, what I've always thought of as iterative genius, it sounds to me it's exactly the same thing as what Dylan did, except this guy just did it on paper, yeah. whereas Dylan kind of did processed it mentally in the back of his head. I personally, I mean, anything is possible, but the whole construct, concept of a lazy genius is very improbable. Both geniuses are geniuses, but they are also hard workers. Okay. Um, I truly believe in that. So, so 
is it fair to say then that most creativity is evolutionary? Evolution in the broad biological sense, in the Darwinian sense? Is that your question? Um, or evolutionary, the kind of a history of individual so, history of an individual So actually, it turns out it can be both, right? Yeah. So in the, you know, you'd referred to it earlier, essentially, I think it's like standing on the shoulders of giants, right? We've gotten here so far, and because yeah. I've gotten Cultural here, I can evolution. see the rest. Yeah, yeah. And But then also uh, evolutionary in terms of the mental process yeah. as we've evolved. Yeah. So, so the answer is I, just both, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, both, yeah. okay. Um, so you wrote about something called the 10-year rule. Can you just explain what that is? Well, uh, again, it's not my invention. It's uh, something which has been in the literature. Uh, 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 I think that Arne Dietrich, that's a very, he's a very interesting researcher, uh, originally from Germany, who studied in this country, and then, to the best of my knowledge, now lives in Lebanon and is at univer uh, uh, some university in Beirut. Uh, so I think that the, he, the one who introduced this notion, I may be wrong, but certainly not I. I write about it in my book, but it's not my doing. Uh, the, uh, the, the notion that it takes, but I, uh, is it 10 or is it 5 or is it 15? Who knows? Right. But the whole underlying concept is that uh, there are no that this notion of some kind of a uh, the blessed naive coming up with some great ideas out of door is tabloid BS. Okay, right. uh, 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 that every that there has to be some mastery of the field as it existed before you, as a prerequisite before you are able to come up with some uh, the, the uh, active genius of your own. And you know, the, so uh, the, and. Uh, 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 Dietrich and uh, some other people uh, they actually studied it empirically. They looked at the age of Nobel laureates and things like that. And that gave rise to this notion that it takes about 10 years of kind of a mastering the field that existed before be right. uh, before you are able to come up with something useful of your own. Is it 10? Is it 5? It probably varies from field to it's field. It's a rule of thumb. Uh, uh, from time, epoch to epoch. But, but the underlying concept is very sound. And, uh, you know, in my own kind of experience, uh, or rather exposure, what struck me, have you been to Barcelona? Yes. Have you been to uh, the Picasso Museum? Of course. In Barry Gothic? Yes, of course. You remember that his works are arranged there chronologically. Yes. And he started out as a as a realist, as a uh, as a realist painter with a kind of exquisite mastery of the traditional realistic forms. Yeah, if you take a look at the beginning of yeah. uh, that museum, you the, might not recognize it exactly, as Picasso. Exactly, and I think that it's very telling. So this is the reflection of his ten years in quotes. I don't yes. know how long it took. Yeah. Him. So I mean, and this kind of gets back to we had this notion yeah. that you add something new to a body of work to propel right. it forward, right. right? And you can't add something new to a body of work to propel it forward unless you actually understand pretty well inside yeah. and out what exactly. that body of work exactly. is. Exactly. So I think that you're talking about that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on this. I'm just going to, I'm going to put it out there because we were, we were mentioning, we were talking about directed wandering. Um, we didn't talk about how hyper and hypo frontality play a role in this kind of uh, kind of back and forth process that that is happening yeah. to generate creativity. Is right. it worth is it worth discussing? Or well, if you think? think it is, we can talk about it briefly. That, that uh, this is a very interesting subject, actually. Uh, that to the extent that the uh, uh, the, uh, the this uh, process is leading to some kind of creative breakthrough, uh, the, uh, the, are a combination of focus and and wondering. Then the question arises: Well, what are the uh, neurobiological mechanisms of these two uh, states, right. contrast, which are synergistic but also contrasting? Okay, and an argument can be made, and in fact, there are some data that this mental focus requires a state of hyperfrontality and this mental wandering uh, requires or or at least benefits from the suspension of this frontal lobe control hypofrontality so there is a very interesting dance between the two yeah? right right yeah. yeah and i think that i mean i think that's important right that's that is essentially kind of doing mental ab testing yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um and while we're kind of Back on our, well, I kind of chucked back onto the list. I'm going to stay there for a second about 
your your comments on nonconformity, yeah. right? So I, I my sense is the statistics, and I I could be wrong by an order of ten. It's either ten about ninety percent of society is is uh, conforming, and ten percent is nonconforming. Again, it's how you measure it. We are talking about imprecise constra- constructs which can be operationalized in a variety of ways. But I guess uh, the, the majority of society is conformist. Yeah. yeah. But there are some nonconformists, and this nonconformism can be very destructive. Or it can be very productive. I mean, an act of genius, which is a departure of existing knowledge, is an act of nonconformism. And there may be partial nonconformism. I mean, Einstein, who was an intellectual nonconformist, I'm sure did not break the law. You know what I'm saying? Right. So uh, it's not all or none. One can be conformist in most areas and nonconformist in others. Yeah. Uh, um, but are you saying then that, that nonconformity is a prerequisite for creativity? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. At least, you know, kind of a, a domain-specific nonconformity. Yes, of course. Um, because you are totally, if you are totally beholden to prevailing notions, then you are unable to kind of a, a, a rise against them and kind of a propose something different. Yeah. Right. So you talked about the anterior cingulate cortex um, as a portion of the brain that kind of lights up during nonconformity. My question is actually... Are certain minds, certain people, more predisposed to nonconformity? Or, well, obviously. So, so, so the, obviously, just because we know that it's ninety ten. Well, we know that the major. I don't know how, uh, how how to quantify it, but the vast majority of the population is conformist, and but there is a small fraction of nonconformists. Yes. Well, you, like, so I guess what I'm saying is, you can't decide I'm going to be a nonconformist. You, you, you know. If you could, then people just would be, and that's fine. But if- You can decide in some sense. You can muster the... I don't think that you can decide to have the mind allowing you nonconformism, but you can, but you can muster some courage to behave as a nonconformist. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, yes, I absolutely see what you're, what you're saying. Because I, there are many people who think differently from the majority, but are afraid to act on it or even yeah. to enunciate yeah. their thoughts yeah. out of just lack of this kind of a social courage. Yeah. And that is something that is that you can decide to, to buster kind of a through conscious right. kind of a decision. I, I, I think, you know, you were talking about it possibly being a vicious cycle. I think nonconformity can, can potentially be a virtuous cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, this kind of gets, again, we were talking about this slightly earlier, but I think this is a good jumping off point for this. Um, and I, I'm not entirely sure I want to hear the answer. Um, creativity, is it genetic? Well, in order to answer this question, you have to first define creativity. And we don't know how to do it. Well, we've been yeah. trying for the we've last 40 minutes or so. Uh, I would imagine that, okay, create, we already established that creativity is a product of many, many moving parts. Right. Genes are part of one of these moving, uh, among these moving parts. Okay. So in that limited sense, yes, but only in that limited sense. Okay. So um, the possibility exists that one could be uh, innately gifted. Yeah. But it, it, it could also exist that perhaps you're not your average in terms of you know your genetics, but you could cultivate creativity within yourself. To to a point, whether you know, again, people, some researchers distinguish between kind of a capital C creativity and lowercase creativity. In other yeah. words, uh, you know, um, everyday creativity, just doing things somewhat differently and better than before, and uh, and capital C creativity, creativity which uh, which changes the world. You see what I? Mean? Yeah. I suspect that in order to uh, the, that the the latter creativity that requires certain biological prerequisites. It may, it may so you're saying I have a I, I probably have a creative ceiling as an individual. Yes, it can be called it can be moved around, but but there are some biological constraints. Okay, um, but let's assume that I have not reached my creative ceiling it can be yet. Moved around. So the I mean we talked about the the ten year rule, but what about the ten thousand hour rule, right? If I continue practicing Correct. creativity on a, a, I can I can again kind of create the virtuous cycle. Correct. Um, will we become an Einstein it remains to be seen. But you will improve certain processes. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um I've noticed that creative people you talked about the some being very prolific. Yeah. Um 
Do you think that proliferation actually is one of those things that can allow me to raise up to closer to my creative ceiling? <laughs> In some sense, you know, remember who Linus Pauling is or was? Yeah, uh, Linus Pauling, sure. Yeah, the, the, uh, he's one of the few people who uh, um, uh, who, who won Nobel Prize twice. Right. So he used to say that the best way of having good ideas is to have many ideas. Uh, For sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the creative process is... Uh, probably require this kind of a generativity and, uh, the, the, and being prepared to have most of one's ideals fail but, uh, and then come up with, with good ones. So there it is. I've wrung it out of you. I've, I've painstakingly gotten you to, to, <laughs> to tell me that I, uh, I'm, I'm not a hopeless case. This is good. Good news. Good. Um, but, but it turns out that left-handed people are more creative. I'm not left-handed. Why are left-handed people more creative? Well, first of all, uh, I mean, that would be too sweeping a statement, okay? But uh, there is some evidence, or at least an argument can be made, that left-handed people are more predisposed to novelty, okay? Uh. So uh, to the extent that novelty is uh, one of the kind of a prerequisites of creativity, that may be true. Uh, making this kind of a sweeping statement that left-handed people are more creative, I would not go as far as that. And my wife will be disappointed to hear that. She's left handed. Yeah. Mm, she mm -hmm. is. Yeah. All right. L l maybe I should um, pose it in a slightly different way. What other traits, for example, do highly creative people also manifest? Well, as I said, I think that there is this. They are intelligent people. And this is uh, and this is not a trivial statement, okay? Because uh, the, in psychology there has been this debate, and in fact a huge a large body of research about the relationship between intelligence and creativity. Okay, mm -hmm. is this the threshold theory? Uh, the threshold theory. So explain uh, that a little bit. Uh, for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, of course, this whole work uh, is limited and kind of flawed and potentially. Uh, open to criticism on numerous grounds because in order to uh, add this question cogently, you need to be able to A, define creativity and operationalize and quantify, you know, define creativity in a quantifiable way and B, define intelligence in a quantifiable way. Well, for intelligence, we have, we have IQ. I mean, there are many, many reasons to 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 argue that it is not a good that not a good kind of a measure of intelligence as most lay people understand it. Right. Okay. So this is already one problem. The other problem is how do you measure creativity? It's usually measured or often measured by the use of uh, the so the so called test of divergent thinking. Ugh. You know, um, the, again... That's a the, technical term. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> the relationship to real-life creativity is also kind of a debatable at, 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 at best. Okay? So you have two elusive constructs, each of which measured in a very flawed way. And then you are trying to examine the relation between these two flaw metrics. So you tell me. That okay? The best you're going to get is right. in a generalization. Right, yeah. But with all these caveats, uh, the, the, this, this caveat aside, it is an interesting question. Uh, the, uh, we have some intuitive notion of who is creative and who is not. We have an intuitive notion of who is bright and who is not. And so what is the relation between the two? I would say that for the most part, most creative people are bright. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you do a Venn diagram, of course, there are many more bright people than there are creative people. But I would imagine that being generally bright, in most cases, is a component of creativity. Probably there are exceptions. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I've heard some people that I've talked to creativity, talked about creativity with, say, that they tend to be most creative when they're least comfortable, meaning they're kind of their backs against the wall and they're, they're really uh, kind of focused to produce um, they kind of you know they'll say oh my discomfort gets you know me to a place where I, I feel compelled it sounds like you're saying that doesn't actually make sense well it does not necessarily make sense to me but that's all I'm prepared to say uh, there are many paths to creativity. There are many subjective experiences of creativity. There are many levels of creativity. So for some people, it may be true. 
Okay. Um, Who am I to say that it is? As I've had a habit of doing through this discussion, I'm going to ask a different way then. What circumstances are people most creative in, typically? Do you, I mean, yeah, you might I, not know. I don't know. I yeah. think it's highly variable. Yeah. I think it's really highly variable. Yeah. Whew. All right. So my last question, normally I ask three, but well, you only, only, only one for you. Okay. Um, all right. We've, we've covered a whole bunch of stuff, right? We've covered uh, the steps in the process. We've covered where your brain is. We've covered the kind of exceptions. We've covered the recognition. What did I leave out? Right. What, what, what do you want to talk about with regard to the creative brain that makes, you know, that, that's important or that's a glaring omission, something like that? Not a glaring omission, but, but I'm, two things. How about asking two questions? Sweet. Yeah. 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 Uh, so there are two topics which have fascinated me for a long time. And finally, over the last few years, I decided to act on them. One is cross-cultural neuroscience. In other words, as I said earlier, uh, we all understand rhetorically that the brain and complex cognition is some kind of a product of the uh, interaction between biology and culture. We have no idea how, to, how it happens. One of the reasons why we have no idea how it happens is because virtually all of our neuroscience research occurs in the Western world, in a culturally homogeneous environment. And as I, as I was working on my book on creativity, reviewing all kinds of literature, and concluded again that all of the virtually all of the research, uh, the creativity research, and there is a huge body of evidence of uh, the, uh, the research now, has been conducted in, in North America, in Western Europe, some in Japan, and increasing amount of work is coming out of China, but also urbanized environments, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I just came back from Japan. You visit their university, they have some of the top universities in the world. They're basically like our university. They're not that different, okay? Uh, 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 but creativity, but the Western world does not hold monopoly on creativity, particularly when it comes to artistic creativity. So I decided that we need to study creativity, but even more broadly, various aspects of cognition, brain development, brain aging, psychopathology, uh, in different cultures. So we're now trying, I've been kind of a South, fascinated with Southeast Asia, you could call me a Southeast Asia junkie. When I was younger, I traveled there extensively, I still do, I you know, vacation there frequently. So I decided to try to launch some research in, uh, in uh, the uh, cross-cultural neuroscience, particularly cross-cultural studies in creativity in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So we now are trying to launch a collaboration with two Indonesian universities, Gajabada University in Yogyakarta and Udayana University in Bali, uh, uh, studying cre creative processes in Balinese and Javanese artists. I mean, both places, both Bali and Yogyakarta are renowned for their multiple artistic forms. So we're trying to do that. The, the, and it's at a very early stage. It may or may not blossom. We will see. Well, so I've got, my, my initial thinking is that that is potentially interesting, relatable in North America to um, what teams do creatively that are diverse. Exactly. Right? Males, females, exactly. uh, of different ethnicities, yeah. different backgrounds. And that too. And, that too. and I, I, so, I mean, I, to me, I would say that that's probably the building blocks Correct. of how you think about how to build a more creative team, right? What's Correct. the kind of a creative because dream different team? different environments, different cultures result in different individual traits. You know, I know that firsthand. I did not grow up in the United States. You can hear my accent, okay? Grew up in the former Soviet Union. So I spent about a third of my life there. You know, I came here at the age of 27. Basically, my formative years were there. And now I've lived here for many years. And these are not just different cultures in kind of a superficial ways, but they kind of promote different cognitive styles. Yeah. Okay? I can't help but thinking broadly that the... There's not one that's going to trample over the other no, one. That they're, that no. they're, in fact, synergistic. They They've synergistic. got to have to be. And we need to understand that. Yeah. So this cross-cultural neuroscience, I think, could be very instrumental to that end. So when we're trying to launch this, in fact, I haven't, uh, the, you know, the last year and a half, I've been spending 
a dower every week on Skype with these Indonesian colleagues, basically de designing these projects. And I've been there a few times. I may actually go there in September again. I haven't decided yet. So you said two questions. And What's question other, number two? That artifi I should, should artificial intelligence. Oh, okay. Yeah, we talked about and this if before. I went, if I were to prioritize the two, it would actually be on top. Right. And cross-cultural neuroscience would, would come out second. Artificial intelligence. The, I am very... It, Given my own background, I started at University of Moscow. I became interested in kind of a formal models of the brain. I became interested in neural nets in uh, when I was 18 or 19. Uh, the, uh, in what today is called computational neuroscience before the term existed. Okay, then I came here, and uh, my career took a much more clinical kind of a direction. You know, life is not a controlled experiment. I don't know what's better, what's worse. And that's how it happened. But I uh, always had this interest. So now I am very interested. Uh, well, first of all, creativity, if it's defined as a combination of novelty and salience, then the agent does not matter. If a machine, people say, well, machines cannot be created. Well, machines have created already some products which human judges found indistinguishable from humanly generated uh, the, uh, products, music, painting. So that is a kind of a specious argument. So I, and from your perspective, what people... I would think uh, are requiring of you is not necessarily to build artificial intelligence in the form of a brain, but to model processes that exactly. are similar to a brain. Exactly. The, the, so there are many clearly uh, current work in artificial intelligence can benefit uh, from learning how the evolution solved these problems uh, in the design of the biological brain, okay? I mean, this whole enterprise of uh, the uh, neural nets, uh, et cetera, was uh, inspired by the biological brain. Then it sort of, sort of diverted into its own directions. But uh, and as we were talking before we started this uh, the recording, uh, uh, this whole field of artificial intelligence became kind of a driven by uh, parochial specific issues. So there are various devices designed to solve specific classes of problems. But the biological brain is a general purpose machine. And in the AI community, there is a growing interest in what they call uh, 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 artificial general intelligence. It's a much more ambitious project, but the, the idea is to try to design some artificial devices which would have this open, potentially open-ended capability. And this opened the door between for collaboration between, you know, machine learning types, computer scientists, and, uh, and uh, the neuroscientists. And so last year, I was in, there was a meeting in Melbourne, Australia, an international meeting of uh, all this artificial general intelligence. They invited me to talk to them as a keynote speaker, so I went there and developed some contact with contacts with some of these people. So now we're beginning to collaborate. So I know it's in the way too early predict category, but um, let's you know I'm going to ask you take a shot and what do you think the intersection of artificial intelligence in the truest definition as opposed to just a machine learning algorithm uh, combined with the ability to generate creativity. Does that just, is the world that we know right now not even recognizable? Is it completely new? Or, 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 is this a, kind of an amazing arc or is it an evolution? Is it slow and grinding? What's going to be in front of us? I think that to a large, the short and honest answer is that I don't know. But a longer and more speculative answer, I think that to the extent that it will happen, and I think that it will happen, it will benefit immensely from learning how evolution of the biological brain solved similar problems. Mm. So I think that this interaction between computer AI, computer scientist types, and neuroscientists is very important. I agree. And uh, of course it exists, but not to the extent necessary for this kind of a synergy to blossom. It's right? early in the game. Yeah. It's very early yeah. in the game. That's it. Let's end here. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, a, a big thank you. Are you kidding me? Fascinating discussion, of course. Um, your insights, uh, hard earned over a, a long and distinguished career. Um, 
the physiological look at creativity. Um, absolutely fascinating. Thanks very much, Dr. Colbert. Thank you for having me. This has been Intangibles. I'd like to thank Denton's Venture Technology Group at dentonsventurebeyond.com for being the sponsor this season and a supportive partner. Operating as a boutique within the world's largest law firm, the Venture Technology Group runs with hard-charging tech entrepreneurs to drive growth through strategic business, finance, and legal advice from Silicon Valley and New York to London, Berlin, Hong Kong, and beyond. Learn more at dentonsventurebeyond.com. I'd like to thank VC Careers for their support, and I'd also like to thank Ben Glaue, who's a fantastic sound engineer. It is a privilege to work with him. Find him on Twitter. His handle is at visible underscore sound. And thank you. Keep an eye out for the next episode. I'm your host, Steve Berg.